Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Time to get going. Today, uh, and or this week, I should say, we are looking at what is a, an organisation or the legal entity called a corporation actually there for? Um, what are its objectives <coughs> and what are the fundamentals of corporate governance uh, that we need to follow? Because this, of course, has some fairly fundamental impacts on ethics and the way an organisation operates and the way that the IT is, is affected and managed and operated and used. So, first of all, we're going to look now um, for this session at the purpose of a corporation and the fundamentals. And then on Thursday in the workshop, we'll be extending that a bit further and seeing how that can be used within the assignment. And there's a cop I'll also introduce you briefly to the Uni UK Companies Act 2006 that has some very, very interesting things to say about the responsibilities of the uh, directors of the company. So to start with, let's have a look at the basic introduction to the topic for the week. We seem to have a little problem with the... Oh, well, have to part of the IT, isn't it? Let's see if we can make it a bit smaller, perhaps. I wonder what's going wrong here. <coughs> Let's just have a little look at the screen resolution, see if we can do something a bit better. I want to go back uh, in a little bit, when I finish this session, my input, I want to go back and look at what you have come up with during the week in your research into the consequences of failures of governments. I'm going to move straight on into identifying the key purpose of a corporation and the fundamentals of it. So if this is what you were supposed to be doing last week and finishing off in your own time during the week. What are the consequences of failures in both terms of both corporate governance failures and information governance? Who are the various stakeholders who are affected? And in what ways were they affected? So we'll come back to that in a little bit. And you were using CBR and other sources to find lots of examples of interesting types of failure, both corporate and of um, information technology type government failures. And you should, by now, have come up with a, an interesting start to your working bibliography of the sources that are going to be useful for part of your assignment in Harvard Standard. <coughs> and that was a task you were set. So we'll see how well you've done on that and where that's taking you. And we will have a little discussion in a few minutes about what you have done, whether you've actually managed to achieve up to about a page, page and a half, 500 words roughly, uh, critical evaluation of what you've come up with, your research, your findings, your ideas, which will feed into, hopefully, as a set of notes for your assignment. And one of the things I'm going to be looking at is, we had some interesting discussions last week, uh, but a lot of it was hearsay, it was feelings, and there was a remarkable lack of real solid evidence. So once I have some good evidence, that's good sources, um, and then some interesting thoughts about, with evidence, and citations about the impact and who was affected. That's what we'll do after we finish this introduction. One of the things you're going to need to do is to find the K interim report, February 2012. 
about the responsibilities of the uh, directors. These are the people who are the legal directors, by the way, the main board. Uh, we'll find in many, many organisations lots and lots of people with titles that include the word director who are not actually legal directors. And you'll find, as a, for instance, in the financial services world, big multinational uh, international banks, you have managing directors, hundreds of them, spread across the whole organisation, above which are various levels of people with titles like executives and so on. And then you finally get up to the chief executive officer, the chief operating officer, and so on, who are probably part of the main board. I want you to find the, f the interim report in February 2012, and then the second one, and that's the full title, published in July 2012. And the title there is The K Review of UK Equity Markets and Long-Term Decision-Making. And one of the points about this is not for you to become experts in the field of financial services companies and how they operate, but to learn to extract from a big report critical items. There are three or four really important things in there that are relevant not just to financial services, but to all companies who have their shares traded on the various stock exchanges. And one of the issues that has been endemic the last 20, 30 years in the West has been the way that there are many, many people who buy and sell shares for very, with very, very short-term objectives. And yet, companies need to be sustainable into the long, distant future. That's part of one of the responsibilities, and we'll see that when we look at the Section 172 of the UK Companies Act 2006. By, because what has happened in the Western markets is that corporate executives are watching the share price on a day-to-day -day basis and making their decisions often on that, rather than worrying about the long term, keeping their company going into the future. And as a little thought, you might like to think about using um, Section 3 of the interim report uh, to get some interesting guides, interesting insights into the whole, the whole area. And then we see how that relates to the Companies Act in a bit. Out of it, we come upon a question or an idea which is called the principle of enlightened shareholder value. And what I want you to do, first of all, is to find out what it is, get a good definition, maybe search on the internet, search on the web, search wherever you can for various different definitions of what principle of enlightened shareholder value really is, uh, who uses it, in what way, uh, what does it do to the responsibilities of the directors and the senior executives of the company, the people just below the main board. And this is part of understanding what a company is there for and what the directors should be doing. And then, as a little side issue, you could then look at what all the stuff in the press about the Wells Fargo over in the States and what they've been doing over the last five years or so. You could look at um, banks in the UK like Barclays, like uh, Lloyds, um, RBS. In fact, all of the big UK banks would be a good area to have a little look, just to get a feel for what's going on. How the executives are incentivizing their staff to do things and finding out what the consequences are. If we look back over the last three or four years, we've seen many, many mis-selling scandals in the UK banking environment. We've seen international banking problems with the uh, derivatives created from subprime mortgages. And we can see all sorts of bizarre things that have been going on that have ultimately ended in huge fines and we see in the press this last week that Deutsche Bank is having a pretty torrid time uh, as what the largest bank in Europe as part of the consequences of what it did back in 2005, 6, 7, and 8 being with huge fines be it from America 
being imposed on Deutsche Bank, we see the potential for gigantic fines being levied against RBS very shortly for the same thing. We've seen Lloyds having problems with uh, the PPI, the um, health insurance type of side, and, 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 and. What has been going on and why does it happen? All comes out of thinking about these sort of things. Well, the final slide here is a, some questions. Because as you remember, I only teach you questions, I don't teach you answers by and large. So the questions are, what is a company for? Is it there to have ideas, to produce products, to produce services? Is it there to provide, to develop or to deliver profit and cash flow? Is it there to provide employment or should they be looking at reducing employment, maximizing this broken top subject called IT to try to reduce the cost of employment, uh, to maximize profit? Does it have a social purpose? Are job companies there with social obligations and purposes? Or is it there purely to provide customer service? And there are probably other questions you can ask yourself as well as you get into the subject. And you've got an hour and a half roughly today, is today to do it, and then you've got all of the, the workshop to develop these ideas a bit further. But they will then lead you to some thoughts that are quite relevant, if not mandatory, in terms of that last section of the assignment. To develop, as you develop that strategy, you've got to think about these. Uh, and whether you should be going for profit, whether you should be going for employment, whether you should be going in terms of social purposes and customer service or whatever. Just to break it gently, think about an airline. Let's call it British Airways for the sake of argument. What is its fundamental purpose, do you reckon? Why do we have lots of big airlines? What, do, what is their real purpose? Ah, that's an interesting one. Yeah. Make money. Pardon? Make money. Yeah, neither of you have said to operate aircraft. Because it's not. It is, as you say, moving backsides and people around the country or the world, long distance, short distance, and hopefully to make money. If someone came up with instantaneous mass transfer, teleportation, as the science fiction calls it, they were getting on that business really, really quickly. They don't care how they're moving people around by and large. If you think about bus and train companies in, the, the, in this country, now you've got stagecoach running buses, they, got, they run trains, because they're moving people. They, are, they don't really care about the means. And for airlines, you know, the fact that they have to buy an aircraft for two, three hundred million dollars to move people is really quite an irritation. The fact they've got to have two or four very large tubes hanging off underneath the wings, which cost ten, twelve, fifteen, twenty million dollars a piece, is a kind of an irritation to them. Because they're expensive. They just want to move people as quickly and as cheaply as possible. They use those ideas as you think about the sort of services you want to develop with the sort of data you're considering, think about what is the objective. Is the data fundamental or is it just part of the whole exercise? Is, are the data sensors fundamental or just part of what we have at the moment? And it may change. And this is one of the things about companies. They have to reinvent themselves as technologies change. Some are good at doing that, and some are not so good. So we have to think very fundamentally, and you're kind of doing, the, as your project, will be doing a Uber, in a sense. I mean, what Uber have done is change the way that the taxi mechanisms are working. A couple of years ago, when Uber came out, no taxi company in Britain virtually had their own app. Now, every taxi company in Britain has its own app. If you go to look at Derby, Almost all of the taxi companies and the private hire companies have their, their own apps. Some of them are now connecting to a universal apps, so that wherever you've got one app, and wherever you go in the, in the UK, you can see taxis around you. All sorts of different companies using Uber technology. 
or approaches. And so I want you to be thinking about the challenge in the assignment in the same sort of way. Breaking the mold, breaking the boundaries, coming up with something really, really interesting, but you still got to think about what's the purpose. And we, see, we thought Uber was just taxis. Today, or yesterday in the press, we see that Uber are now thinking of strongly and buying into the same sort of technology for lorries in the States. Long distance lorries and having their sort of autonomous vehicle type of approach to drive the lorries along these huge straight motorways in the States so that the driver can have a little sleep and then takes over as they come off the motorway or the highways into the smaller roads. So Uber is there to think, is actually there, in terms of partly that, yeah, they've got a fabulous model in terms of their own profitability. They're going against employment as far as they can, get rid of humans, with their experiment in um, Pittsburgh. Or Phil no, it's Philadelphia, sorry. Do they really have any social purposes? Evaluate that, guys. So those are the sort of questions you're going to think, need to think about. So moving on, I'll look, take you through the Companies Act as well. I'm just going to look at section 172, because sec section 172 of the UK Companies Act 2006 is kind of interesting. And what it says is that the duty, fun one of the fundamental duties of a company, or the director of a company, is to act in a way that he or she considers in good faith. So this causes all sorts of interesting legal holds that would be most likely to promote the success of a company for the ben benefit of its members as a whole, and in doing so have regard, amongst other matters, to one, the likely consequences of any decision in the long term. This is showing a list of six items that, that directors should be thinking about as they run an organization. <coughs> Long-termism comes out first. The second one is the interests of the company's employees. Then business relationships with the supply chain and customers and others. Then the social uh, consequences in terms of the impact on the community and the environment. Reputation, high standards of business conduct. And then the need to act fairly is between members of the company, typically considered to be the shareholders, but are not, is not actually only the shareholders, also those who own the various corporate bonds and so on. And going back up, the people who actually work for the company. And the, all those other people uh, mentioned here. Now the reason for putting this here is that if you normally ask a company director what their, who their responsibilities are, they will immediately say, to the shareholders. Now it's interesting you do not see in that list any mention of the word shareholders. The closest I guess is there and, and there. But this re reinforces the position that director's responsibilities, that is the legal director's have responsibilities to lots of other people. Now, one of the interesting things I've got, there's a very interesting analysis uh, a year or three back uh, about this section of the, of the Act. And one of the problems with this bit is it is not easily enforceable. It's not part of the criminal code, so the government's not going to prosecute. The only people who can are those who actually have an interest, as they put it, in these areas. And typically, that's going to mean you have to be a shareholder. 
And if we look at some of those and think about some of the interesting problems that have popped out of the woodwork over the last, say, year, we think BHS, bleeding the pension fund, or at least not keeping it fed adequately, that's directly affecting the employees and the ex-employees. You think about zero to the infamous zero uh, hour contracts in various big businesses and retailers around UK, the UK over the last year or two. Is it really in the interests of your uh, employees to have import, uh, significant body searching after as they leave the uh, business to make sure they haven't stolen anything that then takes the is done in their, per, their personal time, not the employer's time, that takes them effectively below uh, minimum wages. What about those companies who provide carers around the countryside who, uh, to people who are disabled, who have serious prob health problems and other things, and you do not pay them for their travel time, or you give them too little travel time to get between um, <coughs> visits so they can't actually provide a good service? and ends up with a net hourly rate of about half or two thirds of the legal minimum wages. Is that really thinking about the interests of the company's employees? And if you connect back to the principle of enlightened self-interest, if you always negotiate the, the hardest and most advantageous deal for you and the most disadvantageous deal for your suppliers, is that also thinking about fostering and developing the business relationship with suppliers if you are known to be predatory? In the long term, people will no longer be interested in dealing with you. You will go out of business if you are known to be so predatory. So some very, very intriguing and interesting consequences in relation to human behaviour and actually the survival and prospering of your company. <clears throat> a few little extras that you need to think a little bit about. Thinks also about the people to whom the company owes money, the creditors. So, a few thoughts, and we can talk about those as you do your research. If you get lost, come have a chat, and uh, Winnie and I will be able to help throw a bit of light on some of these areas if you feel it's too new, too novel, that you can't quite make head or tail of what's going on. But that's what we're here for, to drop you in the deep end to do some serious levels of research learn what it all means, and then make sense of it. That's what we're supposed to be doing here. Because next year, when you're out in business, you are going to be dropped into very similar sorts of little holes, little research areas, to come and try and make sense of what's going on. So this is going to help your employability as you learn to find the questions, develop the questions, do the research, understand the critical points. And like I said last week or the week before, one of the things you've got to learn to do is to not read every single word in the whole of the Companies Act. I said, go look at 70, uh, Section 172. That's the most important bit. And then go and do some research to find out what people have been saying about Section 172, what it means, how it can be applied, whether it is actually of any relevance whatsoever, other than as a, hey guys, this is a good way of behaving, but we can't enforce it. In which case, what's its point? Is it just there to raise interesting questions so that people begin to understand what they ought to be doing if they're doing it right, good governance? So as to try and help shape people's ideas. Okay guys, thanks. Off to it now. <laughs>